name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in your name once again for our Good Hope Lutheran Church Pentecost Day service this morning. Gracious God, we pray that you would continue to fill each and every member of our church with your gift of the Holy Spirit and continue to excel in your divine ministry as your sole witness. Dear God, in this critical period of pandemic times, the world, including our country, is still faced with an unprecedented situation that we have never experienced in our lifetime before. Father God, this COVID-19 mutant virus is posing greater risk and burden as it continues to infect people in multitudes of all agents and walks of life, some losing their beloved ones abruptly. Heavenly Father, we come unto you in our humble knees and pray to you that you would remove this virus from this earth by your grace and mercy immediately. We know, Father, as you promised in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We also pray for the protection of the frontliners who are overwhelmed and pressured daily by the increasing number of cases and mortality. Dear Lord, we also pray for our members who are sick or suffering. Lay your caring hands on them and heal them. We also commit members who are still unemployed or jobless for your mercy and providence. As we prepare our heart and soul to hear your message on the coming of the Holy Spirit today, we pray that you would liberate us from all our iniquities and conform to your teaching and be your witnesses throughout this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man who takes refuge in Him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after time declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their hands and write it down on their hearts. I'll be their God and they will be my people. Verse 34. No longer will people teach his neighbor or man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Here ends the reading of Old Testament. Amen. The epistle reading for today is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And there, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthenians and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and the strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Here ends the reading. The Gospel text for this Pentecost Sunday is taken from the book of John chapter 14 verses 23 to 29. The Gospel of John chapter 14 verses 23 to 29. I am reading from the King James Version. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I say to you. 
पीस आई लिव विथ यू माई पीस आई गिव टू यू नॉट एज अ वर्ल्ड गिव्स डू आई गिव टू यू लेट नॉट योर हार्ट बी ट्रबल्ड नाइदर लेट इट बी अ फ्रेड यू हैव हर्ड मी से टू यू आई एम गोइंग अवे एंड कमिंग बैक टू यू इफ यू लव मी यू वुड रिजॉइस बिकॉज आई सेट आई एम गोइंग टू द फादर फॉर माई फादर इज ग्रेटर देन आई एंड नाउ आई हैव टोल्ड यू बिफोर इट कम्स that when it does come to pass you may believe here ends the reading of the gospel text for today let us pray our lord and heavenly father we praise you we thank you we praise you for who you are because you are a good and wonderful and mighty god Father we just come before you asking you to bless this time as we worship you in spirit and in truth speak to us a lot of mighty god as we worship you today we just want to sing our hearts out to you because you are worthy of all honor you are worthy of all praise and we just want to honor you today father we just surrender every moment of this worship into your hands in jesus name we give thanks and we pray Amen. Father in heaven. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. Be your kingdom, be established in our praise. As your people who pray, who pray forevermore, yes, O Lord, you who pray forevermore. Father, you reign, O Lord, mighty God. No matter what circumstances that we might be in, O Lord, God, even with this pandemic that is going around. Father, you reign, you bless, and you will take care of your people, O Lord God, from the youngest to the oldest, O Lord Almighty God. There is power in you. When we know, O Father, under your wings, we will find sheltering grace, O Father. Under your wings, O Lord Almighty God, we will find the protection that we need, O Lord God. Father, you are a good God. We just want to surrender, O Lord of God, each one of us into Your hands, O Lord of Mighty King, my Jesus, my Savior. from god our father and the lord jesus christ amen let us pray o gracious heavenly father thank you for granting us favor to worship you in today's pentecost sunday morning service as we meditate on the pentecost message of the coming of the holy spirit on the 50th day after your glorious resurrection and ascension we pray that you would continue to dwell in us as our advocate comforter and the holy spirit guiding and leading our daily lives 
Help us to remain strong in our faith and continue to exhibit the fruits of your Holy Spirit in action and use your spiritual gifts to glorify your name. Help us, Lord, to understand your scripture and lead our lives according to your will. Forgive our trespasses and use us as your effective tool to spread your good news to people who are still unreached. Continue to guide us and lead us by your grace and your Holy Spirit to prepare ourselves for your judgment day. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Greetings to you, all our Good Hope Church members today. Uh, it's very nice to meet all of you via this uh, online service platform this morning. And the theme for today's sermon is the coming of the Holy Spirit. Based on the epistle text we read this morning, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Let's look at the background of this passage. Just before Jesus Christ ascended into the heaven, on the 40th day after his resurrection, Jesus promised his disciples who were gathered with him at Mount Olivet in Jerusalem, that is the upper room, the coming of an advocate who shall indwell in their hearts and believers as the Holy Spirit that would guide them, lead them and protect them until his second coming. That is the judgment day. Jesus assured that these disciples shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they shall become his witnesses, expanding his ministry and kingdom throughout the world's end of the world's of Jerusalem, including Judea, Samaria, and you name it. It's all written in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus also reminded his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the day of the Pentecost. That is the 10 days after his ascension. So he is talking with the disciples in the upper room, in the same place where he was highlighting about the events are to fall, for fall, what going to happen after his death, resurrection and ascension. So he is giving them the strength and uh, motivation just to be prepared and he is going to use them mightily. As they were asking lots of questions and Jesus was answering them and they were more interested to know where Jesus was going. He was saying, I am going to the Father and you cannot come to the place. I am going to prepare a room for you. I will be back again but in spirit. So here this is the event. As promised, Jesus returns as the Holy Spirit on the 50th day after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost that is celebrated throughout the world today, this Sunday 23rd May. With the supernatural power, he returns with the supernatural power to baptize the followers and the disciples of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit in order to expand his kingdom. So we see at the background here, Jesus is well aware the plans of God, the Father have sent him for, and he knows what is to happen next. So he prepares the hearts and souls of his disciples, giving them the motivation instead of anxiety to be prepared and to be gathered in one place. That is during his ascension period. So, what is Pentecost? I think many of you will be wondering, what is Pentecost? Pentecost in the Greek word means 50. So, in the Old Testament, Pentecost is a major Jewish festival among the Christians, basically those who believe in God, celebrating on the 50th day of the Passover. It was an established practice which is being continued even till today. Everybody will be flocking on this particular day of the Passover to Jerusalem. The Israelites presented their first fruit of their harvest to God as their thanksgiving offering on the 50th day. This was a requirement by law and therefore this was what was happening on a Pentecost day. Okay, on the New Testament, and the New Testament, it commemorates the descending of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and believers in Jerusalem 
which is now extended to the Christian community residing all over the world. And as per his gospel going therefore commission, it is a strategy adopted for them to go and preach the gospel. If you see in the first part where the first fruit of their harvest is given, there is a purpose in God's creation. There is a purpose in everything. God has his own timing, my dear friends. If you look at the first fruit of their harvest, that is the first thing they have to give them from the harvest, first harvest. Once they have handed over the gift, they are blessed. And then they will continue to have a bigger harvest. Similarly, Jesus Christ is given here as the first fruit of the harvest as he comes down to the disciples in the form of the Holy Spirit to dwell in their hearts. Once he empowers them, you can see if you read Acts chapter 2 onwards up to chapter 7, you will see the disciples and all Peter will be baptizing in numbers, 3000 and numbers. All the Gentile nation will be turning towards Peter's sermons and you will see uh, Stephen and others will be martyred to stones to death. So you can see the expansion of the territory and the kingdom. So Jesus comes as the Holy Spirit as the first fruit of the harvest. And then the harvest is expanded by the disciples, by them going all over the places of the world, as well as the news being carried out now till the end of the earth as required by us. Now we are baptized by the, in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. When we accept the Lord, we are given a great commission. Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. There, therefore you must see there is a coherence here. There is a coordinated uh, uh, event taking place between Old Testament, New Testament, the first fruit. The first fruit is Thanksgiving. Now Jesus has offered us a Thanksgiving uh, uh, material for us to prosper his ministry throughout the end of the world. So uh, the day of the Pentecost also marks the beginning of the church. As you see. Jesus returns as a promised apostle and also the advocate, sorry, comforter and the Holy Spirit to empower his disciples and us, including believers who come to the church and who are Christians today, to carry his noble task for the people to be saved, the sinners. Therefore, my dear friends and sisters in Christ, so this event that takes place on the day of the Pentecost in Jerusalem, it is not premeditated. It is not something that was planned for by the disciples. The disciples were in a disarray. They've been chased around. They've been hunted. They've been wanted to be killed by the Israelites as they were the followers of Jesus. But they trusted Jesus as he briefed them, as you see in the part, first part of the Acts, where he prepares his uh, disciples just before ascending. If you look at that, after telling them that he's going to come back as a comforter, don't worry. And... After that, Jesus ascends into the heaven in the presence of the apostles and others. So this is the promise that Jesus has given. So the two historical perspectives that we can look into this background are the Pentecost feast procedures are specified. If you look at for details in Leviticus chapter 23 verses 17 to 21 and Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 9. It's a thanksgiving offering from the first fruit of ours as I just explained on the 50th day of Passover. It is a fresh offering, first fruit offering, all right? It can be a wheat or corn freshly taken from the harvest and uh, it has to be given to God for as a thanks God, thank the offering. So they also used to give away uh, two fresh leaven breaks and also uh, unblemished, seven unblemished lambs along for the blessings and thanksgiving. It was offered to the temple Levite priests who were appointed by God and who acted as a middleman actually between God and man in the Old Testament. The priest would certify and qualify the quality and then of the product they hand over as a first fruit and then waves and accept the offering with a prayer. That means their thanksgiving offering has been accepted and they will be blessed. So the other event that we look at it is a second historical perspective. The Jews also commemorate on the 50th day of Passover, the unveiling of the Ten Commandments. 
as Mosaic law in Mount Sinai. So this you can look at Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5. So here is one incident where God is unveiling the Ten Commandments through Moses, his mediator here and his prophet. Similarly, this has been abolished by our Lord Jesus Christ just before the Passover period where he was assembling the disciples on the upper room in Jerusalem whereby he unveils the new covenant of love which we have heard about it through my sermon earlier. So let's look at the, now we have seen the background. I'm taking you through some of the pertinent points of this book, Acts chapter 2. Let's look at verse 1 to 4. What is it all about? Uh, 1 to 2 and also 3 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together gathered in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. As Jesus promised, he returned 10 days after his ascension in the presence of the 120 apostles who were gathered in Jerusalem in a house. It's a house or upper room, we are not sure. Based on the biblical text, we look at it, it's also upper room, house. So he could accommodate about 120 apostles, which includes Mary, Jesus' mother, and his brothers along. So in the upper room, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, it came with a devastating power and a sound of mighty wind accompanied by tongues of fire, touching each and every one of the disciples present, empowering them to speak various languages. In, we call it tongues today. People from Israel and all over the Mediterranean diaspora, including Gentiles, stretching from the east to west of Israel, and north and south of Jerusalem, witnessed this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and were greatly amazed. So, let's look at the three signs that were given here. There are three signs that come into the four. Sound, if you look at the text. Another one is a wind. Number three is the tongues of fire. So, based on these signs, let's evaluate. A mighty trembling sound. A mighty trembling sound with a rushing mighty wind like a roaring sea or storm a whirlwind or hurricane, you can imagine it, fill the 120 apostles and believers who are gathered in one accord. I take it as the upper room. So it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here, if you look at it, the mighty trembling sound was visibly not present in the in their sight. But they could, could feel the mighty trembling sound. It was a mighty power. But there was no no effects to prove there was a sound but that sound was there and they came with the power and might and it it was a devastating so they were all surprised and um, this roaring sound and mighty wind that onset in the room amongst the disciples is actually the groaning tongue of our god so if you look at the wind and the sound the wind there was wind like a hurricane with the sound like a roaring sound like a, a big sound and they could hear it but they couldn't see anything visible except the tongues of fire which was visible the rest of the sound and others were not visible to them but it could be even heard outside the room but the tongues of fire only was visible to the disciples who were gathered on the upper room so it engulfed them it engulfed them it came as the Holy Spirit engulfed them. It's the groaning of our tongue of our Lord Jesus Christ. It engulfed them, immersed them fully and baptized them instantly with the filling of the Holy Spirit. It was an amazing, amazing supernatural act of God empowering the believers gathered in the upper room. So we have seen how events take shape here. On the other hand, friends, you look at it in the Old Testament and New Testament narratives. <coughs> If you look at it, God manifested himself on two occasions to Moses. In the Old Testament, if you look at it, uh, he appeared to him like a fire. Once again, the fire is indicated in the Old Testament where God appears as a fire in the bush. 
to deliver Israel through Moses as a prophet. You can see Exodus chapter 3 verses 2 onwards. And at that time an angel appeared in flames, in flames of fire from the bush. And Moses went to see why the bush does not burn up. So same situation if you are prevailing here. So in this, uh, once again if you look at this situation, there was a sound, there was a wind, but not visible, just like Moses had. So the other one was, God manifested to Moses once again when he delivered the law on Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, verses 16 to 20, with signs of thunder, lightning, trumpet, blast, everyone in the camp trembled violently. So this is a replica, you can look at the upper room now. Jesus is coming in this New Testament, as the Holy Spirit, at that time, there was sound, trumpet type of sound. There was sound and wind and power. So the same thing we can feel. So God had the purpose in the Old Testament and the New Testament to resolve the problem of the Israelites who were stiff-necked and didn't follow God. And therefore, he sent Jesus as his Savior, yet they don't believe him. They nailed him. And now he sent his comforter as the Holy Spirit to be dwelling among us. Dear friends in Christ, the apostles received the influences and gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is a sound, strong wind and tongues of fire through God's supernatural power by an invincible mean. It was not visible. Unlike today, you have seen the 19th century preachers who have come with the Pentecostal teaching and all that. You see, they will prepare you with a class and everything that you must ask for the power here, no need to ask for power. It's very clear. God acted on his own discretion to empower them. It is God who gives the power. So we can see here the supernatural power by invisible means. So we have seen this and nothing to worry about. It's not a premeditated event or prayed for an event, uh, but simply an amazing act of God. Unlike today's world, based on his divine power and his own timing. Okay, let's look at the third, uh, the other aspect, the tongues. Then there appeared to them the divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterances. The tongues of fire here, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. It split into each one of them. The Spirit of the Lord from heaven, came down with an amazing sound and thunder, wind and filled the hall and it was spreading one by one, touching one by one, one by one, it split. So the tongue split and sat on each of the disciple. The cloven tongue, we call it, stayed stationary on the head of each disciple. This is proof that the Spirit of God had made each disciple as his temple of residence by the influence of God. If you look at Acts 2, 3, you will understand this. The cloven tongues points to the diversity of languages touching each individual and the fire seemed to indicate the spiritual gift. So they were possessed, they were immersed, they were just filled with the Holy Spirit and each and every one were touched. And each and every one, it symbolizes, are able to speak in a different tongue, which means a different language. All right, different language. So what is the language all about? If you read verses 5 to 11, I'm not going to read, which takes a long time. The, here we look at the, 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 the people who have gathered, even from outside and inside among the disciples, or 120 of them, they were amazed. What's happening? Are not all these Galileans, Acts 2 verse 7. So these are the persons who know nothing about the dialect, or they don't know anything about their own country, they are not educated apostles, and they don't speak fluently in their language because they speak more of Aramaic language and not familiar with the Jewish language either. But how? How? And second aspect, we look at Act 2 verse 8. How is it that we hear each in our own languages? So you must understand the crowd that has gathered there is from a different diaspora, the crowd from different diaspora of the Arab nations. Mediterranean cultures with different languages were amazed and perplexed and were anxious to know what it all means to them. What's happening here? What is the meaning? 
everybody was speaking in tongues and praying for them. So, example, every man heard them speak in his own language and they enabled to address the stranger in his own language. Example, if a Roman presented himself to the disciple, he was immediately unable to address him in Latin. If a Grecian in Greek, they, was, uh, they were talking in Greek. If an Arab uh, person was uh, to present himself to the disciple, they were speaking in Arabic. And so the rest. So it was an amazing experience that happened on the upper room on the day of the Pentecost as Jesus promised. The disciples themselves spoke all these different languages. Yet the miracle is the same. That particular miracle of the descending of the Holy Spirit. So it's the miraculous supernatural power of God that enabled an Arab to understand a Galilean apostle speaking in Arabic. For example, you go to China. Let's say you are an Indian. Then you are going and praying there and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. A Chinese guy comes to see you and asks you to pray and you are filled with the Spirit. You are speaking in Mandarin to this guy who knows only Mandarin. Who enables that? Jesus. It's not an artificial language that is present today in many of the uh, preachers' uh, uh, session. I do not want to comment or criticize, but you should be having deciphering spirit in you and understand what is right. The scriptural base. On the scriptural base, it is a language of the individual. It's not a common language. That common language, even Paul advocates, it is to edify you and God. You can go to the room and speak how you want to speak to God in your own language and fill with your spirit. It can be any language that God will understand you. But if you are going to talk in a church and a lot of believers come into the church in the Corinthians, you were ready that they will not understand what you are saying in a tongue unless there is somebody able to interpret it. So if you look at the gifts of the uh, Holy Spirit, that is in Corinthians chapter 12 and all that, you will see all the details. So going back to this, what is observation we have here? Let's look at some of the observations I uh, picked up here. Uh, there was suspicion, of course. There were many people who were amazed and accepted Jesus as their savior, of course. And uh, there were crowd that is also coming into the room from outside. They all accepted. But some of them mocked the disciples. As usual, there are always people who are going against negative people. So they mocked them saying they may be drunk. Note, a prophecy is fulfilled here when they say they are drunk. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 21 and John chapter 10 verse 34. If you look at it in 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, verse 21. In the law, it is written, this is what Jesus says, With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to these people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Even Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses and most prophets warned the Israelites to heed to God's teachings. But they were very adamant, arrogant and will not listen, provoking God's anger in their displacement and destruction of the temple eventually. You have seen that all in the Old Testament. That's what takes place. Therefore, they have seen the, they witnessed them. They witnessed the miracles of God uh, out of Egypt and everything. Yet they don't listen to God. They are just arrogant and therefore they have stepped next. So they as Jesus repeats again the prophecy here in uh, John chapter 10 verse 34 and Paul highlights again in 1 Corinthians cross reading. If you look at it, so the law is written with man of other language as in other lips. I will speak to these people and yet for all that they will not hear me. So they have stiff necks. But here you see with men of all nations, I will speak to them in different lips. So this is happening on the Pentecost day. Jesus is using the disciples to speak to the diaspora of the Arab and the Mediterranean territory people were Rome, uh, Greece, uh, you just name it, so many countries, there are 14 countries stated in the biblical perspective, you read it, okay, go home and read, okay. So, therefore, Israel as God's exclusively chosen nation failed in its exclusive divine ownership as a single nation. As such, God opened a window for the Gentiles now to share in his glory through this Pentecost experience. What does this mean? I've written down here. Israel was given exclusivity. Only God belongs to Israelites. That's what the Judaism all about and all these people believed in. Therefore, the Gentiles who accepted uh, uh, 
uh, Christ also have to become uh, followers of the Judaic principles and terms, circumcision and others. But Jesus broke all that. So therefore, Israel people were given an exclusive opportunity, but they were not good and they were not willing listeners. So God withdraw this authority and the exclusive right of the Israelites from the day of the Pentecost. As such, you can see is opening a window through the Pentecost arrival and empowering all the disciples and us as a church, the beginning of the church. The church started to prosper. The Gentiles accepted Christ as their savior in baptism after the Pentecost experience. They started spreading the good news and the, they built churches thereafter all over the Mediterranean territory. And dear friends, this is what the first fruit that first came as Jesus Christ, all right, on the day of the Pentecost, the first fruit is a first offering, fulfillment of the prophecies where Jesus filled them with the Holy Spirit. After the fulfillment, after the first harvest, you see the harvest, the first week and onwards, is a greater harvest. Who does the harvesting? That's where the empowerment comes on you and me and the church, where we go all out, go in there for, make disciples. So, Jesus' disciples toiled their life after that, continued, and they continued to create miracles, wonders, and do Jesus' ministry that touched and won so many souls for Christ. Today, that is the expectation of Christ from us. So, what is the observation here? Basically, in conclusion, here, the prophecy fulfillment, we can see two Pentecost events correspond with the Old Testament and New Testament. So, on the day of Pentecost in Exodus, God gave his law that we have seen. It has a thunder and lightning similarly. So in the New Testament, we have also seen that. On the day of the Pentecost, the New Testament acts, God sent down his Holy Spirit. So see the difference. There was thunder and lightning in the first part of the Exodus, where I already highlighted to you, when in the Mount of Sinai, Moses uh, unveils, there was thunder and lightning. Similar experience was felt in the New Testament of the Pentecost day, that is the Holy Spirit descending uh, in, you know, God's timing from the heaven down to the room, rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire that sat on each other. Unbelievers are still under this law. Many of them don't still believe in Christ. The law reveals man's sin, need for a salvation. That's why Christ came. So, hence, through this Pentecostal experience of New Testament, this Old Testament is fulfilled by our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. By Jesus coming down and dwelling in us as the Holy Spirit, the old Mosaic Convents became irrelevant, as I highlighted. So with Jesus' new covenant, that is love God. If you love God, you will love everybody. And first, love your neighbors. If you love yourself, you must love your neighbors. So if you love God and love your neighbors, all the Ten Commandments are already included in these two great covenants. So it's an act. It's an uh, it's an accompaniment together where Jesus uh, unveils this, all right? So, as we can see, this action is also a prophecy by Jeremiah. The days are coming. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, not the old one, but the new spirit. Spirit, Jeremiah 31, uh, you can look at verse 33. He emphasized the Lord God as saying, put, he, he will put his law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and that will be, he, Jesus, God, will be our God. And they shall be my people. God says that. So, Jeremiah's prophecy is now fulfilled with the Spirit outpouring and dwelling on the believers after the Pentecost day, Acts chapter 2. So, go home and read this book. Very important. So, there is always a bearing of the prophecy taking shape in the New Testament. And this prophecy is taking place right in front of our eyes. So the other one is uh, Old Testament versus New Testament. God uses indirect approach in the Old Testament. You noted that God spoke through his prophets or sent his spirit as God's intermediary to forewarn of events to unfold for the disobedience of the Israelites. Even kings were not spared in those days. You can read in number 11 verse 36 for an example. But God used direct approach from the day of Pentecost in New Testament. God has done away with the intermediary. God has done away with a mediator and a middleman. You don't have to go through anybody. Come through Christ. As we have seen that. So, no need for an intermediary anymore. As the spirit has descended and indwells in it, each believer, 
and counsels us and speaks through his presence individually as a Holy Spirit. Therefore, now Jesus is no more physically present as he told them in the upper room earlier, forewarning them, uh, will, he, will he be seeing you? Will I be seeing you? They, Jesus said, he will be coming as a comforter. So he comes as a comforter. You don't have to go in physically and search for him. He is already dwelling in you once you accept him in baptism and become a Christian. So, no need for a mediator, my friends. As a believer in Christ, you no longer need to go to a mediator, as I say, even like a priest. You can pray to Christ direct. Or you don't have to go to friends or mediums today to solve your personal problem and your mysteries in life. As Jesus has not returned, as, as Jesus has returned as a promised Holy Spirit to indwell in our hearts individually. So he individually dwells in our hearts and therefore leads us and guides us our paths. So through prayers, we can reach him. He's dwelling in us. So we should be able to be happy now that Christ our Lord is dwelling in each of us in us, not uh, something it is uh, uh, you have asked for, okay? And uh, the God also uh, expects us in this part of the teaching, we can see, He expects us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit as Christians, you must go in action as an example of Him. Otherwise, how can you be stool? Therefore, you must inherit all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is the charismatic uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some can be interpreting dreams, some can be uh, 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 speaking in tongues, somebody can interpret the tongues, all right? Uh, some have the power to heal divine. So the nine powers and the nine gifts, you go home and read, it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 12, and Romans 12 as well. And the five, five fruits of Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22, all of us know that, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gratefulness, self-control. With all this, we are equipped as a Christian upon baptism and we should reflect our lifestyle as a Christian. And people see us by not name, but by action as a Christian and they want to know more about Christ and they will be drawn to Christ and this way we are glorifying Jesus' name, God's name. So in conclusion, the goal of God's plan is that He will be glorified among the nations. That's for sure today is happening. To equip his church with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit so that he would be his witness to all the nations resulting in his eternal glory. So uh, let us uh, pray. A gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this eventful occurrence on the day of the Pentecost that you descended into our lives as the Holy Spirit just you had descended into the hearts of these souls of the disciples you have chosen among the 120. Father, we understand it is a tough challenge. It's not easy. As you dwell in us as a comforter, advocate and the Holy Spirit, we have to reflect you in our lifestyle and action, Father. Sometimes we digress. Sometimes we go into sins and all this, Father. Help us to be uh, guided by your Spirit, by your deciphering Spirit to lead us out of these doldrums and troubles of our life and all the sinful natures and diversion. Help us to cast all the burdens on you. You will net us not astray. You will continue to sustain us. You will continue to lead us. You will continue to empower us as your mission partner to reach out to the entire world and to the unreached people to glorify your name and setting an example and winning souls for you. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Salutation and Benediction Please stand. The Lord be with you together and with you also. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 God bless you all.